S&P 500 investors have been the biggest losers since 1972. Compared to mid and small cap funds, they've performed the worst during the majority of 30 year rolling periods. They've also performed the worst during the majority of 20 year rolling periods. And hold your breath because they've performed the worst during the majority of 15 year rolling periods as well. All of this is part of the reason why you might hear some people suggest adding a small cap value fund to your holdings. It's not until we get to the most recent five and 10 year rolling periods, starting at around 2010, where we start to see the S&P 500 outperform both mid and small cap value funds. To pile on just a little bit more, for us S&P 500 investors, we've also been getting crushed since 2001 during most five, 10, and 15 year rolling periods by other funds that focus more on growth and tech. So why in the world should an investor continue plowing money into this type of fund? Because at this point, it's starting to look like a terrible place to invest when we compare it to a few alternatives. Investing in an S&P 500 fund is considered to be a good way to capture the returns of the entire US stock market. While it's not going to capture the pure market returns as something like Vanguard's total US stock fund, which holds thousands of companies, it's going to be close enough. That's mainly because these 500 stocks represent about 80 to 85% of the US market and span across most industries. Technically, you should always find periods of time where the S&P 500 underperforms not just the funds that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, but many others. Heck, at one point, we even saw a piece of trash fund like ARK outperform an S&P 500 fund for a short period of time, then crash back down. Yes, contrary to popular belief, <laughs> five years is considered to be a very short period of time in the investing world. By investing in an S&P 500 fund like VOO, SPY, or any of the index fund versions, you're a reflection of what the US market is doing over whatever period of time. The market's average returns, AKA the S&P 500 average returns by nature, consists of a group of stocks that perform well and a group of stocks that don't. It is basic math that we all learned back in fifth grade. And some of those outperforming stocks happen to be held within particular funds like tech or growth, which cause those funds to perform better than an S&P 500 fund. So the fact that there's funds outperforming the S&P 500 should not be a surprise to anyone. Unfortunately, a lot of people only want to talk about a few winning funds that are beating the market and ignore the large number that didn't. Not to mention that an investor would have had to have gotten lucky enough to find find that fund, that one fund that will outperform in the future and also invest in it before it actually outperforms. This is where recency bias can get the best of you. It could cause you to assume that mid and small cap value will continue to perform poorly against an S&P 500 fund since it has over the past few years. We could also say the same thing about those growth and tech funds that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. They've put an S&P 500 fund to shame since 2011. And based on a lot of comments I've received over the years, there's a ton of you out there who have benefited from this because you decided to allocate a portion of your portfolio in that direction. Usually when I ask why these people add this type of fund to their portfolio, most of the time it's because of strong recent past performance. What you just said, is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. And of course, they expect for that outperformance to continue going forward. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. This is not a knock on any of you guys or gals who have done this because it's your money so you can do what you want with it. If you've had success with it so far, then more power to you. But always remember that by adding other funds beyond something like an S&P 500 or total US market fund, you're in a way speculating with a portion of your portfolio. No, God, please, no, no! There's nothing wrong with that as long as you understand and are willing to accept the risks involved. But at the end of the day, you are, for lack of a better term, gambling on an unknown future. But I guess technically we all are to an extent since we're out here investing in the stock market. For any of you who do this, it's always good to remind yourself that no matter what's happened in the past, there's not an equal one-to-one -one risk reward trade-off. Taking on more risk doesn't automatically mean you're guaranteed a higher return. So for every, say, one point of risk you take, there's not an equal positive one or negative one return. 
you've done well in the past, it is easy to trick yourself into thinking that it will continue. The human brain just isn't made to handle this sort of thing rationally. The famous investor Howard Marks shared his thoughts on risk and return in a memo he wrote back in 2014. Here's a more realistic graph that he shared. He said, as you move to the right, increasing risk, the expected return increases. The range of possible outcomes becomes wider and the less good outcomes become worse. He goes on to say that this is the essence of investment risk. Riskier investments are ones where the investor is less secure regarding the eventual outcome and faces the possibility of faring worse than those who stick to safer investments and even of losing money. These investments are undertaken because the expected return is higher, but things may happen other than that which is hoped for. Some of the possibilities are superior to the expected return, but others are decidedly unattractive. Once again, it doesn't matter to me what you do with your money, as long as you understand what you're doing and understand all of the potential outcomes. If you wanna help support my little dog, Molly, who is actually laying over there right now, and support the free content on this channel, then please make sure to hit that thumbs up button. With investing, I don't think us humans give enough credit to how luck and timing play into this whole thing mainly the returns that we all end up with. My favorite chart to share on this channel is the one that I randomly created on a Saturday night when I was doing some deep thinking about the role that luck plays in all of our lives. Yes, I'm that guy who sits at home on a Saturday night and creates spreadsheets <laughs> in his free time. Here are the average annual S&P 500 returns over different five, 10, 15, and 20 year rolling periods. Person A who invested in the 20 year rolling period going from 1977 through 1996 would have ended up with a 15.3% average annual return. But person B who started their 20 year investing career one year later would have ended up with a 17.3% average annual return. That's an outperformance of 2% per year because of sheer luck and timing. We all know how you should get your money invested as soon as possible. But in this example, the person who may have dragged their feet for a year ended up outperforming the person who might have done the right thing and taken that advice by investing their money as soon as possible. The same thing goes for the two 20 year rolling periods ending in 2020 and 2021 an average 2% of outperformance between the two years. Yes, I just cherry picked those specific dates on purpose to make my case. But the broader point is that none of us know if we're going to happen to be the ones who were on the wrong side of history based on when we start investing. The outcome of luck and timing can only be observed after the fact. Look, you can either be the type of person who allows luck and timing to throw you around for the rest of your life, or you can be the type of person who chooses to take more control over how things play out. The only solution is to make sure that you're continuing to take action by putting the odds in your favor so that say a few percentage points of underperformance isn't going to destroy your financial future. Accepting the average stock market returns and focusing on things that you can control, like your savings rate, will give you the best chances of success going forward. Just investing in something like an S&P 500 or total US stock market fund for your US stock holdings is going to be good enough and a good enough strategy that you stick to is better than the perfect strategy that you don't. You could potentially gain a little more outperformance by adding a bunch of other funds alongside either of these two US stock-based funds. But is it really worth the time and effort to take on that additional level of risk in hopes that this potentially happens? Once again, it's your money, so that's for you to decide. I personally don't think so. But then again, what do I know? I'm just some random dude on the internet that enjoys eating magic mushrooms in his free time. YouTube thinks you should watch this video to your left next. Support the free content on this channel down in the description below. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button as well. Done.